so uh, things are winding down. I've just got two more lectures. And so I was going to talk about the existence of normal bundles and uh, a few things like that. Well, they haven't quite sorted it out well enough yet. So but I thought it was appropriate to do a <coughs> review. And also, I never did prove the product structure theorem using concordance implies isotopes. So the review will kind of tell you, remind you of the lay of the land and, <coughs> and what's missing. Uh, so remember, uh, we just started with topological manifolds. And what did we prove about them? Well, <coughs> you know, not much was known. But one thing we proved was that uh, they're collared. So that's a, uh, so manifold with boundary has a has a collar, for example. Uh, and uh, what else was it? Well, we proved the Schirm, topological Schirm space theorem, and we talked about uh, the Alexander isotopy. And, uh, and bounded and bounded homeomorphisms. That sort of fits together. Remember, if you had a homeomorphism of Rn that was bounded, uh, then it was isotopic to get in. Because anyway, that, that's sort of a crucial point. Um, not hard, but nonetheless an important point. So these were all, well, Alexander was old. This, these came about around, night. these are both due to Schoen, both due to Mort Brown, and also, of course, the Schoen phase theorem to Barry Mazur. <clears throat> but they were, all, they were all done by 1915, 1960 or before. And then, uh, what happened? Well, so then, so this is uh, before less than or equal to 1960. Prehistory, and then uh, <coughs> then Milner wrote his paper on microbundles. Milner, and then uh, Keister proved that these contain bundles. Uh, in particular, tangent bundles. So after that, we, so this is about 1962. So then we had, at least we had tangent bundles for topological manifolds. So we're still, we're still, you know, still in a, not using anything, any, any grand machinery yet. And, well, there was some other interesting work. There was, there was stuff on stable. Stable manifolds by Brown Block. But in the next thing we covered, then we then got to the Torres trick. So the Torres trick, that's just like this big diagram with uh, turning homeomorphisms into homeomorphisms for the torus, or a K wall across the torus. You know, we've seen that quite a few times. So that goes in two directions. So one direction is when the homeomorphism in question is small, or it's close to the identity. And if it's small, then within, you get out of that, you get local contractibility. Rn rel boundary, and then of GS manifolds. So you have local contractibility out of out of out of this torus trick first for just Rn, then with handles BK cross Rn, and out of that you got you got this. And so this is partly mine, and partly uh, Bob Edwards gets into some of this stuff also. Wave to Bob. Uh, 
Can I wave to Bob? That's oh, yes. He's, uh, I heard he's listening, he's watching. <laughs> we'll have to find out whether he's stuck with it all the way to the 10th, 11th lecture. <laughs> uh, yes. So then, and then this implied uh, uh, isotopic extension theorem. We're all in the topological category here. And then that, that gave us uh, topological inversion theory. You know, you know analogous to the smooth case, um, sort of what Smale and Hirsch did. And this is the topological case. So this is all something that went uh, beginning with this, with the Torres trick and working the small homeomorphism, that all of this came out of that as a, as a sequence of results. So that, that is again very in the world of topological manifolds. And I might say, by the way, this was also done by Chernovsky independently in Russia by an argument that I never did tell you about. Um, but there's only so much time. So, so Chernovsky also comes into this. So there was that. And then the other direction, I think I haven't forgotten anything. So the other direction is now to start talking about structures, PL structures, smooth structures on the manifold, and what can we do there? Well, again, we can, we can hold off as long as possible applying big machinery. Uh, Although, well, so the first thing is to, is to uh, apply the Torres trick. Um, well, you know, apply it for cat structures, where cat means PL or diff. And by the way, uh, I just, I haven't mentioned it, but I'll just mention it very briefly. Uh, for Lipschitz structures also. And this was done by Sullivan. So the same, the same ideas can, can be used there. I'll just give one, one more word about it. Uh, what you have to do to make things work in the Lipschitz case is to uh, replace the torus by another manifold. Well, what other manifold? Well, the key fact, the key properties of the torus are that its universal cover is thin in space, and that if you punk, take out one point, you can immerse it in the plane, in, in the REM. So remember, we were always using that immersion of the punctured torus, and then we were always taking the cover to be REM. That was the key features of it. Well, it turns out, in the Lipschitz world, you want to the the uh, this part about bounded homeomorphisms doesn't work for Lipschitz homeomorphisms because the problem and you say so you need something a little stronger uh, you need you need these lifts to be the lift to Rn to be even better than you do for just boundedness. Lipschitz thing came later, it came after, came later, came uh, later. seven or eight years after you, yeah, it came about, um, about so to speak, 1977, yeah, yeah, something like that. Anyway, the point is that uh, you now want a hyperbolic n-manifold, and the hyperbolic n-manifold, well, its universal cover of a hyperbolic manifold is going to be a hyperbolic n-space, so that part's fine, that's kind of automatic, but then you want it to have a trivial tangent bundle so that when you remove a point, you can immerse it in Rn by the immersion theorem. Because then you have a bundle map, and if you have a bundle map, you know, if you take out a point, if the bundle, the tangent bundle is trivial, then the tangent bundle of Rn is trivial, and when you have a bundle map then you'll have an immersion. So that was very hard to find. It, it took, uh, Dennis once said that it, it took uh, most of his knowledge of different parts of mathematics to come up with this. And this, I've still never understood an argument myself. It's very easy to, I haven't it's never been I mean, properly written. It uses, it uses a lot of other stuff. Oh yeah. Uh, some arithmetic work. Groups. Yeah. yeah. So so finding that manifold is not easy. But once you have it, 
then roughly the same kind of arguments work. So there is that, and that's all I'll say about Lipschitz. Well, except one more comment about it, namely that when Donaldson did his work showing that certain four manifolds did not exist uh, in the smooth case, uh, whereas they did exist for topological manifolds, uh, when, when he did that work, in 1982, it was only a year or two later that he and Sullivan together uh, proved that the same thing was true for Lipschitz manifolds. In other words, I was rather surprised. All these hard analysis, you know, PDEs and, and uh, uh, whatever, that went into Donaldson's early work, uh, it turned out to also be true for Lipschitz manifolds. All you needed was a Lipschitz condition in order to make that, that uh, analysis work. And so they're able to show that these topological four manifolds of Friedman also did not have a Lipschitz structure. So, so manifolds are Lipschitz uh, if and only if they are not dimension four. I think that's right. So anyway, so we, we, we now use the torus trick where we have some cat structures involved. So then, Again, there's a fork here. So we can, we can just, so this is just, uh, just zero handles. So if you just assume Wall's theorem for the end torus, no cable across the end torus, you just assume that, then you can straighten zero handles. Or you can assume that the original manifold is a stable manifold, meaning it's got a it's got coordinate charts with overlap, and the overlap is a stable homeomorphism, which, if you remember, says that a homeomorphism is stable if it's a composition, each of which is the identity on a possibly different open set. And being an identity on an open set enables you to get your hands on a homeomorphism and, uh, for example, isotopic the identity. So you could just work in that category, so that's yet another category, or stable manifolds. You don't want to apply a wall, just assume that you're in a nicer category than top, a little bit nicer, and then, and then what follows this arrow will, will work. So with that, you can prove concordance implies isotopy. And with that, you can get uh, the product structure theorem, which is what I want to prove today. Say that in a minute. So that, that's, and then with the product structure theorem, you get all these applications. You have an application to uh, transversality. You get one to the uh, exist handle body structures. There's uh, uh, a well defined simple homotopy type. So that you remember all these things, sort of, that like we covered. So from that, you get these, these two things. And by the way, I think I said something incorrect here. I think I said that all manifolds, except for top, except for non-smoothable four manifolds, were handle bodies. Well, I don't know how to, when I thought about it, I don't think I know how to do this in dimension five. So I don't, so five is open. It's not the kind of thing that we know there's a counterexample dimension four. Yes. And dimension I thought there was a theorem of Larry's which said it's either four or five. But maybe I don't know whether it's in if only. Yeah, I don't that's, I don't know. I thought about it a little bit the other mm. day and I couldn't think of a reason why I do this for dimension four. Well if you don't know, I don't know yeah. for sure. So, so dimension <laughs> four, if it's smooth, of course it's a handle body. Yeah. And if it's not smooth, it can't be a handle body. So that's so. And six, yeah. everything in six or higher is a handle body. That's your. But five, I'm not sure. So five, I don't know what I said last time, but I might have mistaken. Dimension five is a question mark. So you get these applica nice applications. Topological terms for seven. Uh, topological handle bodies. So you get that out of the product structure term. So if you're in the stable world, you still don't have to assume anything, any, anything kind of outside this subject. 
in order to get these results. So I want to prove this in a few minutes. Give you a sketch of these. But then going in the other direction, so going the other direction, uh, well, what, we, we can calculate, well, we apply a wall. And we use walls down throughout. And from that we get, well, just from the statement, it's quite easy to get a non-straightenable Preamble. So then, then, uh, so then uh, you know that there's something, something. Uh, there's, there's some. Uh, what's the word? Uh, I can't think of the word. Anyway, there's 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 uh, there's something, not something non-trivial about this the whole subject. You can't just go ahead. And, uh, Put a PL structure, unique PL structure in every manifold, and then that's just the end of it. Instead, there's something interesting happening, uh, something pathological in that sense that they're not all topological manifolds are PL. Uh, and then, uh, well, then you can straighten. Straighten, straighten is just a slang for saying it has a PL, you can make it PL. And straighten. Everything, all the other handles, and so then out of this you you get the pi k of time on PL is uh, zero or Z two, remember that proof you used inversion theorem. And then, uh, and so then we went into this. Uh, so then we went into a sequence. There's a sequence that says that uh, if the tangent bundle of M lifts to a cat structure, cat bundle. So lifting to the cat model implies uh, implies that M cross R S has a cat structure. And then for the product structure theorem, that implies that M has a female structure, a cat structure. There's that sequence, and this is kind of the, and so then, uh, well, so one point is the obstruction to the lifting uh, belongs to the fourth cohomology of n with these two coefficients. So that's where that, so now you have this nice cohomological condition that says when you can't, can they can't do it. And then the number of lists, the, the uh, homotopy classes of lists, that corresponds to the third cohomology. Drops down one. This is these are this is an isomorphism. This is just an obstruction. If you have one lift. Then the, then the number of lifts are exactly this. I mean, it could be that this is, it could be the fourth homology is not trivial, but the obstruction is zero. Um, so the homotopy classes lifts correspond to that, and the homotopy classes are, are the uh, isotopy, uh, isotopy classes of cat structures. On uh, and across RS, and that's corresponding to the <coughs> cat structures on M. 
So this, this, so this is this is a nice answer. You've got you know whether you know in terms of obstruction in a simple cohomology class whether or not you have a cat structure in the manifold, and then they're classified by the story cohomology, which is usually something you can calculate. So you get all this answer. Oh, by the way, all of this is m greater than or equal to five or six. Be a little careful doing things in dimension five, especially if you have a boundary. But, uh, but that's all high dimensional theory. Now there's one part of this that I haven't told you about. Um, this is going from here to here, it's just the product structure theorem. And this is the uniqueness version of it. So that's that we're going to do now. But there's this, if you have a lift to a cat bundle, why do you get a structure in M cross RS? So this part, this thing, is Friday. That's going to be the last lecture to cover that. And that will include proving that, I didn't say it over here, but it'll include, so in here, micro bundles is the existence of normal Stable normal bundles. Now remember I said once that in general if you have a nice locally flat embedding of topological manifold and another manifold, you don't necessarily have a normal bundle. But if you stabilize, then you do. So the stabilization is important. So this statement is an ingredient it's going to, in front is going to be an ingredient in showing that uh, that this lift uh, gives you a, a cap bundle. And therefore, well, it's the, sorry, if you have a lift to a cap bundle, then you get a cap structure in M cross RS, and that's going to use this fact about normal bundles. So there's a little bit of bundle stuff for Friday, and then uh, today, Talk about the product structure theorem. And that kind of, you know, there's just I wave my hands at lots of different parts of this, but that kind of gives you this overview of, of um, what was known by 1969, 70, hard to mention anything that's later than that. But not very much extra has been added since then. So you're almost up to date. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing dramatic. Been added except in dimension four. Okay, so the product structure theorem. Well, So it uses concordance and applies isotopy. So let me remind you of what that is about. Uh, so uh, let W M plus one be a, a cat concordance. from M0 to M1. So these are dimension M as usual. And oh, we'll have a structure here called theta. That's the name of the structure. And the structures here are um, let's call one sigma naught and one sigma one. These are really the same manifold. So but with different perhaps different uh, cat structures. So then, well, and let, uh, we might as well throw this in. So, uh, let's, so let's see. Let uh, um, theta equal sigma dot cross i w w is really it's a concordance, so W is really M cross I. So it's really M cross I with a 
some cat structure on it, which doesn't necessarily preserve the eye factor. I mean, it's just a, it's, it's not a cat structure on him crossed with eye. It's just a cat structure on the on, on, on W. So, but we can say let this be true. Let it be a some cat structure on uh, a neighborhood U of the compact C, compact set C inside M, inside W, well, inside M. So you can pick something in in M where this is this is just a product structure on a neighborhood of a compact set, and then let uh, B be a neighborhood of another compact set uh, D. I used to call these CDUV theorems. So we had two compact sets. You've got something that's already good on this compact set, and you want to extend it to a bigger compact set, D. And the U gave you a little bit of fringe that you could throw away if you needed to, give you a little room to work. Uh, so then you then the structure on U, restricted to the C, could then be extended to D, and you didn't have to muddy the waters outside D. You only had a little fringe around D where you might have to move things. So that's that, that's how you always keep going from one chart to another chart to another chart. You're always using the, you're always doing that on a topological manifold because you what else can you do? And so you always need a theorem like this, but this works quite well. It's it makes it makes the theorems a nuisance to, to state because you always got to keep throwing in these extra hypotheses. And you know, anytime you see a theorem that takes this much of a page. You really don't want to have to read it. <laughs> so, but nonetheless, it's just it's just the same same stuff. And we'll add one more thing about uh, epsilon mapping W to zero infinity. The, uh, just a continuous map. This is going to tell us how much we're allowed to move points. So what this means is that when we do something, it's not going to move a point more than epsilon, the value of epsilon at that point. So you keep things small. And the moral, the, the, the philosophy here, the moral here is that we're working with charts. Charts have handle body structures coming from a triangulation often. And you can make, you can keep subdividing that triangulation until it's, until it's so tiny you can hardly see it. And then all the handles are so small you can hardly see them. And then when you do these constructions with handles, you stay inside this, this epsilon. So there's never anything hard about this epsilon. You once, if you think you need it, you just examine the proof and, it's, and it works. But I'll, I'll mention it this one time. All right, the conclusion is then, this is a theorem statement, then, um, There exists an epsilon isotopy of there's an epsilon isotopy of uh, W satisfying um, epsilon isotopy H sub T. So A satisfying the fact that H naught is the identity. Uh, H1 or HT is equal to the identity on either end. So let's say the first end in the sigma naught. So that's not going to change. Uh, HT the identity there and near C, C cross I. T factor is not in the I. This is this that I is right here. It's the, so you already had this this product cat structure in the neighborhood of C and U, and 
now you may have to throw some of you away, but you still got, you haven't moved anything near where it was already good. And then H1, uh, well, H1 mapping uh, W or M cross I with the structure sigma cross I, sigma naught cross I, to, again, to just W with uh, theta is cat. So you can say this in two ways. You could say, I mean, basically this isotopy, the way to remember it, or the way to think about it is that this isotopy is taking theta and moving it around until it becomes a product. So this, this, uh, this moves theta until it is a product, sigma naught cross i. And now, by the way, this is this is almost trivial. In one sense, this is trivial because W is an escobordism from from uh, I mean, it's, it's a product. So it's a sort of automatically an escobordism from one PL manifold to another. And the escobordism theorem says there says there a uh, uh, that's just a product. And so, what do we have in addition? Well, the, es the Escobordism theorem doesn't give you this epsilon condition, but you could get it if you worked hard enough. Um, it may not give you this isotopy, but uh, the Escobordism is, is how it's proved. Because you're going to go through the, the big diagram of the torus trick, and when you get to the spot where you've got uh, BK across the torus, with a funny structure and one with a standard structure, you're going to look at that and say, you got a concordance there. You, there you're going to use the Escobordism theorem of this BK cross TM. And that's going to tell you that the one you didn't understand is really just the standard one and the whole thing could be a product. So you have to remember that in the midst of the uh, diagram for the torus string, uh, some of the time we get we get what we want because the homomorphism was small. Sometimes we get it by applying Wall's theorem. But a third way to get it is if you have a concordance, and we, that's the assumption that we do have a concordance. And so you do this, prove this first for handles, and then after you got it for handles, then you got it for everything. That's that's how. So prove first for handles. As I said, it just involves using this concordance to give you and the Escobordism theorem in the middle of uh, the big diagram. So uh, so now we want to use this for the uh, product structure theorem to prove that. Uh, so there's a diagram, uh, really the one that's drawn by uh, by Larry, I think, in the, in our in our essay one of the book. And the diagram looks like looks like this. It's, it's schematic, but it's, it's really quite accurate. So the, the diagram looks like this. Well, here's M, and here's R, the R factor. So we're, we're uh, doing the product structure here, which isn't stable. So we've got, we've got a cat structure on 
m cross r. So I've got structure theta, and it's that same theta, and m cross r. And theta equals sigma cross r uh, on u, which is a neighborhood of this complex set C. So we've already got it fixed up, that complex set C, uh, where it's the product. And now, uh, then, a theorem. Then um, there exists an isotopy moving a theta to sigma cross R, um, uh, fixing sigma near C. Well, and this is a little, a little imprecise. I don't have a sigma yet. So, there exists, uh, there exists an extension of sigma to the neighborhood of D, being extended over D, and and an isotopy moving theta to that new that new extension cross R. So just, yeah. So it's the same kind of game. So uh, schematically then, here's, uh, this is, I uh, don't really need the colors. So this is C, and a little further is U. So that's an open neighborhood, usual notation. So we've got things fixed up on C. So here, so everywhere, everywhere is a everywhere there's a structure of theta, which is not necessarily a product. But when it's a product, we'll draw it this way. This is something. It's something on C. And it's actually extends over into U. So if the product structure here, and we have a, we have sigma here, but then over or as it continues, it's just it's just you know doesn't there's no structure on M from which sigma theta can be a product. I mean, you should think of this as that. There's a, there's triangulation. The triangles are are like that, but what the, how they intersect the M is nothing nice. That's, that's how you. It's, okay. So then, <coughs> how do we get how do we get the structure of theta to somehow make this a, a cat a cat cell manifold and then a, a product? How how do we extend sigma? You know, how we get charged overlap, you know, whatever, on, on the rest of M, and arrange to have it a product. So how do we do that? Well, there's three steps. So step one, so let's see, this is at height zero. We have the reals here, so we go up to say one. or some, just a ways up. So step one is to use Stable or um, zero handles. So I mentioned this up above, and the arrow coming this way, and the arrow going start going down that way. But you're using you're either using wall for zero handles, or the fact that the assumption that the manifold is stable. Use that to isotope. M cross, let's say, three force to five force to the standard uh, 
intent to be, it means something, a structure, uh, a structure sigma prime across this interval. Or perhaps a smaller interval, but whatever. So this is, this is, uh, I didn't mean M, I meant, uh, Yeah, I want, I mean, I mean a uh, chart. Because we do this chart by chart. So, so over here, overlapping this, is a chart. And we're going to go chart by chart. So a chart is a, is a, is a copy of our end. The point is, this is a zero handle. Rm cross a little open interval is an open zero handle. And because it's an open zero handle, we can use, we can use this to an isotopy that uh, will make it standard. So therefore, we, we make this standard. So perhaps rather than start erasing this, I'll draw the next version. So after we've done this, uh, you see U, and so up up here at one for a ways up in here we we made the product all the way across. Uh, we've messed things up in between because this only happened in this neighborhood. It only, ha only happened in here. So we mess things up in between, but it's still a product down here. As, as it was before, we haven't touched stuff down here. And it's still, and uh, you still have, you still, you still have the, uh, when we did this isotopy, we, we uh, change this, it might, might wiggle a little bit, if you change it some, but it's still, there's still a structure. It's just not a product, but there's still a structure there. It's, there's no, uh, it's no longer, it's, it's, what we did was we lost the product part here. Because what we did here was, was n plus one dimensional, and it just moved things that way. So it's no longer a product here. But the original structure, this the, whatever this big theta was, it got moved in here, but it's still a structure, an m plus one dimensional structure. And does the sigma prime line up with the sigma? Uh, because this, what we get here is kind of, whatever it is, maybe it's a sigma double prime. I don't know, we get some structure there. But I haven't, uh, where did I say sigma prime? Uh, top um, of the right hand board. Oh. Well, that's what I call, okay, yeah, this is sigma prime. Yeah. So this part, I see your point. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. I shouldn't have said, said it this way. This is, this is going on like this, and then it's a product, and then it goes on like that. What I want to make is it's attached. It's it's uh, there's something wiggling in here, and then it becomes straight. So it's it's a product here, it's a product here, and there's still it's global. This global structure. Well, having having messed this up, we have to restore it. So now step two. Restore. Restore over uh, neighborhood of C cross R. So we're going to restore in here. That's the first application of concordance implies isotope. Because right here, we have a concordance that's wiggly between two structures, a structure here and a structure here, on 
C cross R, our neighborhood of C cross R. And so that's this can be applied. And what it does is it wiggles. So the you know, we were keeping it fixed at the sigma zero, so we're going to keep it fixed there at the, at the zero level. So we're going to, we're going to have an isotopy from it, the importance of place isotopy. We're going to have an isotopy which fixes it here and then makes the product across here and it wiggles it here. So if you think of this, it, it's, it, it wiggles it here so that that can become a product again. But it stays, it stays in that level. When you wiggle, the wiggle is this way. Because the product, that, that's the theorem of concordance applies isotopy, it works on zero to one. And when it makes a product, the one end stays in itself and just wiggles this way. So step two, you restore over a neighborhood using the concordance applies isotopy. On on, 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 well, on neighborhood of C cross, plus C cross I. Okay, so that's, so now the new picture I guess so so we keep using that. I'll put a picture in here. So the next one now looks like there's a there's a R again, here's M, and C, and out to you. And now we have a and now we have a product structure all through here. And then out here at level one, still a product, and down here it's a, down here it's not a product, it's just whatever it is. So this, this is now wiggly, well, you know, it's, what I, it's, it's whatever it is down here. So there's a global structure which is a product here, and there's a product across here but is not a product down here. And we want to get it to be. Well, now we use the concordance of bias isotopy yet again, but a little different version of it. Slight, well, slightly different version. Because um, I want this to be the fixed end, because that's where I've got the local product structure. And then I've got a, uh, so here's, here's how you want to think of it. It's the, the case now where sometimes, sometimes, which is the way I stated it here, the, the point is that now, now, here you've got overlaps which are not PL. Because the, because uh, What I want to say is down here we have handles that we want to straighten. But they are at the end of a concordance. They're at the end of a concordance. And up here, at that level, everything is PL. Everything is it's in that level, it's a PL structure cross R. So there's a PL structure. This is all PL or cat, cat structure there. And down here we have handles and we want to know if they can be straightened. But if you go up to this end, they, they can be. So this is like having a, uh, this is like, let's say it this way. Uh, imagine that this is, and now I need an extra dimension here to show this, and you have one handle that goes like this. So the feet of it are back here, where it's PL or cat. The feet are back here, but out here it just wiggles and we don't know what it is. So you want to straighten it. Well, you've got a concordance up here, and now at this end, it is straightened. 
So when you go into the torus trick, you've got you've got a structure on the PK cross the torus, P1 cross the torus, and it's concordant to the standard one. Well now you use the Escobordism theorem at that level, which tells you you can solve this problem, the handle problem, and you can straighten this handle. So we just continue to straighten handles across the chart. And then that, then that is what gives you the new sigma across a chart. So we, you know, over in this picture, here's this chart, and you, and you want to get you want to get extend the structure sigma across this chart, and you do it handle by handle across a large compact piece of that chart. Across D. D is the large compact piece that you want to cover. So you can straighten handles going across here because they're attached by this concordance. It doesn't have to be, it can be wiggly, it just has to, they're attached by that to something which is straight. And then Escobar's and then gives it to you. So then that will that will get you to straighten this out. It'll get you the new structure sigma here, and then you move on to a new chart and continue. So it's, it's uh it's, um, I mean, that's, that's the argument. Um, and it's, it's uh, I don't know, uh, Larry had an argument. Um, I was looking back, I don't think I really quite understood. It, it, when I wrote, I gave lectures on this in, in the winter of 1969, and I, when I, whatever I wrote for the product structure theorem was just sort of uh, lacking in, sort of lacking, let's just say it that way. And then, uh, I, I don't know what Larry's argue, real argument was, but anyway, um, this is what I thought of later on, and then I was happy. He was already happy with, with his understanding of it, but this, is, this argument finally made me happy. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's that, and then uh, maybe maybe Friday's lecture will be short because we just have to do this. We have to do normal bundles, existence of stable normal bundles in the, purely in the topological world, and then use that to show that if a if a tangent bundle lifts to a cap, you know, then you can put a structure on M cross R S. And once you have an M cross R S, you're back here. And use the product structure theorem, structure theorem to bring it from M cross RS to M cross RS minus 1 to M cross RS minus 2. And you keep splitting all factors as here until you get it down to M. So, thank you again. Thank you.